today in this session we are going to deal with creating social infrastructure for inclusive growth and we are honored to have Sri Dinesh Sharma former special secretary in the Department of Economic Affairs Government of India and former director on the AIIB board with us today thank you very much sir for kindly joining us and of course we have got a very distinguished panel we have Sri Shyam Jagannathan Commissioner and Secretary Finance Department Government of Assam Sri AK Yadav is the Chief Administrative Officer Construction Northeast Frontier Railway Ms. Halla Mathir Kadhumi Senior Water Economy is the World Bank Sri Sabasati Datta, Executive Director, Asian Confluence, and Dr. Otujit Khetrimayam. He is the Associate Fellow and Coordinator, Center for Northeast India, Vivigiri National Labor Institute. So with that, I would just turn it around to the session chair and request him to take it from there. Sir, you have got a program there? Yeah, of course, sir. Good morning, everybody. And uh, it's really a happy opportunity when uh, all of us are assembled here, when a bigger show is being played on the TV. And I know I am depriving you of that. But by now, I am sure the results must be more or less clear. So I don't think there's any suspense remaining. But those of you who have great interest in politics and have still chosen to be here, I really appreciate that. This session is about one, and, uh, one hour and 15 minutes, so we have very little time. And when I was told that, that I have to chair it, and when I was told about the panelists, that made my job very easy, because in such a short time, such a distinguished set of panelists here, the chair has hardly anything to do. The introduction has been there in the concept note, very brilliantly summarized the issues. Issues are known to all of us who are in this field for long, and uh, means we can talk about many of those issues, but uh, finding solutions is not easy. But talking helps, seminars like this helps. Institutions like AIIB and other institutions which are already there in the field, they also help. I could have said more at the beginning, but uh, that would have been like the, like trying to, say, take advantage of my position as a chair and uh, take as much of footage that you can do because of that advantage. I would restrict myself from that. My job is to start and to summarize in the end. Starting has already been done by Mr. Mano Mazumdar. I would try to do a good job of summarizing what happens here in the end. That's what I plan to do as a chair. And in this one hour and 15 minutes, I'm told there is some time for audience interaction also. So I'll request all my panelists to be as brief as they can and uh, say what they think are the most important things which should be discussed, talked about, and uh, we can go further from that. I think we can start from uh, my old friend here. I'm being partial to him because we know for long. And he has been in Kerala. I am from Kerala. He has worked in the Northeast, and he's from, uh, he has links with Andhra Pradesh. So he's an all India person and a very bright person at that. And since he's the local person here today, he gets the first say. So I'll start with Mr. Shyam Jagannath.
Morning, everybody. I'm indeed uh, very grateful to uh, Sri Dinesh Sharma, former Special Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs, for his very kind introduction. And I very warmly welcome all the participants here and my co-panelists on the stage to this wonderful part of our great nation. I will uh, take approximately eight to 10 minutes. And uh, since the emphasis is largely on creating social infrastructure for inclusive growth. I will breeze through the historical context because uh, no doubt since yesterday, you would have had an elaborate insight largely because of the very distinguished speakers who would have interacted with you. But recapitulating allows me the platform to at least put forth a logical statement as to why the Northeast specifically needs a special incentivized structure to ensure both socially inclusive growth and also infrastructure creation. So I'll start with a warm welcome and thereafter the agenda in the presentation is structured as this. I talk about the uniqueness of the Northeast and very specifically its geostrategic importance. Then since we are in uh, the largest state in terms of the geostrategic epicenter, Assam, and uh, my being presently incumbent in the capacity of Commissioner Secretary in the Department of Finance in the government of Assam, I would be partial to the state of Assam. And thereafter then, I broadly look at the evolving framework as in how we address our social infrastructure gaps and how do we envision translating and bridging those gaps. Now, this is something which is around 1900, if you broadly just to recapitulate, the connectivity then, and some of the eminent speakers since yesterday would have talked about the landlocked isolation. Now, it still is there. The chicken snack at the Siliguri corridor is a reality. Most of our infrastructure in terms of power, in terms of digital connectivity, actually happens from there. Whereas, earlier historically, the area had access to the port. Chittagong port was one access point. Then you had the Stillwell Road, which was obviously for strategic reasons during the Second World War. The idea is to say that historically and uh, in terms of institutional evolution, we have ended up with a part of the nation that is geographically locked and is not as well connected as it should be. Now, given the connectivity, given the ease with which we connect to each other, I don't think it really addresses the extreme geostrategic importance that this region has. What we have tried to do is uh, take the center of uh, a circle and draw basically concentric circles around with distance radiuses. So if we radiate out towards the west, Delhi is say uh, approximately around 1,500, but then you are also covering Vientain. You're also going further down to Bangkok. You're reaching out. So basic idea is it's the focal point of the ASEAN group of nations. Fortunately, there is institutional recognition of this now. You have the look east policy, the institutional arrangement thereof, and uh, of course, the states which are there in the Northeast, like Assam, for instance, has set up an Act East department. And, uh, uh, one of the very senior colleagues, uh, Mr. Ravi Kapoor, must have placed before this August House the strategy that the uh, Assam government is at least pushing forward very aggressively on the Act East policy. As I speak, uh, since yesterday, the Honorable Chief Minister is also in Vietnam. And uh, Vietnam largely for examining how agriculture, now Assam predominantly is agriculturist, we, we are an agrarian economy, almost 70% of our population and around uh, 65 to 70% of GDP originates out of agriculture. But despite so many subsidies, so many SOPs, why aren't we at the same level, if not internationally, at least nationally, we have something like the lowest in terms of agricultural credit extension, we have the lowest offtake of agricultural subsidy, 
the power subsidy to the agriculture sector is one of the lowest and there is a cost disability in reaching out and incentivizing agriculture as such. Now, Vietnam as a showcase, there are very little, in fact, practically zero subsidies to the agriculturists and they are essentially an export-oriented agricultural economy. And, and interestingly, most of the technology transfers to Vietnam have originated from India and India-centric India research. So how have they succeeded while we haven't? Now this is a question that we need to address. Now part of the answer could be here. I have just tried to walk you through time. We had this interesting slide which we presented to the 15th Finance Commission when they had very recently visited the state. It is basically trying to tell that through time we have continuously been at a disadvantage. 1950 was perhaps one of the largest earthquakes. This raised the entire bed of the river Brahmaputra. It's a massive river. Now, around the early 1900s, the river was something like six kilometers across as an average width. Today, it flows more than nine kilometers. We lose around 8,000 odd hectares of land every year annually. And the cost is almost around 4,500 crores in terms of annual flood damage. 62 again was a severe psychological setback, the Chinese aggression. 71 again was the creation of Bangladesh, where after not just the demography, but also issues such as the chicken's neck, the connectivity issues happened. And there of course there were internal administrative issues because you had the hill state movement, you had the creation of independent states, you had the creation of separate states like Meghalaya, two union territories of Arunachal, which are now states, and Mizoram. And there have been painful experiences within the Indian federal system too. I mean, uh, infamously said, Mizoram could perhaps lay claim to being the first actual territory uh, which had to be bombed by its own air force. Now, this, this is uh, just, just to flag where we start as, as uh, in terms of disability. Uh, 79 was the beginning of the foreigners' movement, massive ag Assam agitation, which still, as I was discussing with the Director General, results in a semblance of peace and normalcy today, but a very fragile peace, which, which is built on a very fragile foundation. We continue, and it is only after around 15 to 20 years of prolonged insurgency which essentially led to, uh, forget about investment, what I would say would be it led to actual cost of capital, whatever was internally available here. And historically, Assam was one of the states with one of the highest per capita incomes. Now I'll run through because uh, this is the same thing. We have an infrastructure deficit, short working season, high cost of maintenance of capital assets, disaster prone and unique administrative setup wherein you have the six schedule areas which ingeniously under the constitution are allowed to develop by themselves. Now, would we be able to replicate normal administrative structures there and how would we augment and build institutional capacities therein to ensure that there is no disparity when development effort is initiated in these areas. The map, interestingly, is changing. I just wanted to show you how composite and difficult it is. The yellow areas show you the Chur areas. The Chur areas are riverine islands which appear when the Brahmaputra water recedes from the floods. These are populated by very marginalized population who do extensive agriculture and they can living out of that, but very, very marginal conditions. The blue is the actual flood affected area in the state. The colored, the red, yellow, and green are essentially tea garden areas. Now, tea garden areas actually started with this historical indentured labor from the Chota Nagpur Plateau and all during colonial days. And, and uh, the conditions have largely been the same. Now, if you look at this map, it shows multi-ethnicity, diverse geography, international boundaries, poor connectivity, and a start disability towards 
a multifaceted sort of a developmental push for this area, thereby underlining what I have been trying to again and again submit in multiple forums, the need for a special dispensation for the Northeast as such. Now, you will have to allow me to rush through because there are other eminent speakers there and uh, uh, please bear with me for another five minutes. Sikkim is, is a turnaround story. Uh, I just wanted to recount that they are also a part of this region and yet they have found their success story. So that gives us some hope that the other states too can perhaps do the same. These slides would obviously be circulated among the audience that is there, so I will not reiterate it. The, the emphasis was on tourism, then on agriculture and floriculture. Their success story is something we should look forward to and replicate. And they have grown at a compound annual a CAGR of 11.05% continuously since 11.12 to 16.17. The first emphatic statement made by the Honorable Chairperson of the 15th Finance Commission was that at least the Northeast, and specifically Assam, needs to have double digit growth annually to ensure that we pull out of this morass of being uh, always at the bottom quintile of the social indicators. Now, Yunnan is again the, the how China has actually led and, and forced the development story there. Historically, it was underdeveloped, again, geographically isolated. But they have ensured by a massive push that the per capita income over a period in the last 20 years has quadrupled four times. Whereas in, in Assam's case, pre-colonial days and during the British time, we were perhaps the second or the third highest in terms of per capita incomes. Today we are perhaps the fourth lowest. Now, where and how do we bridge social infrastructure? Because one is of course capital asset creation, your roads, your bridges, your big ticket expansion, which basically is pushed through by mere uh, financial brawn and then ensures the necessary infrastructure that is there. But can you assure that creation of capital assets and the conducive atmosphere for growth will allow the same kind of growth when your social indicators are not, not really uh, very great to write home about. Now, the United Nations has globally uh, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, an extensive framework, and uh, they have a 17 goals. And here is where I would like to showcase what the state of Assam has done. And this is extremely a sharp focus on each of these individual goals and what the state government needs to do in partnership with the government of India to ensure that we do translate all these SDGs as achievable goals in the Assam Agenda 2030, which is the Assam Agenda and the vision which the Honorable Chief Minister has uh, formally announced. Now I'll run through the goals. Uh, the, the red line is actually how at 2030 we're to reduce poverty uh, to zero. But the blue line is business as usual scenario. So you can understand the gap between the two as a graphical representation based on 2011 baseline trends. The massive emphasis on all poverty elevation schemes that would be needed. Uh, similarly, on the zero hunger initiative, the gap again between the red line is how it should be. The blue is where business is as usual. So wherever the, the whole idea here in projecting this is if you look at the health indices of Assam. Now, uh, my colleague had done a wonderful job on showing this. We showcased this before the uh, Finance Commission also on infant mortality rate. Assam is at 44, whereas the top five average are at 10.2. Kerala is a completely uh, different story because they, they reached the, these levels, uh, as Dinesh sir, sir would definitely uh, point out, that 20, 25 years back. The maternal mortality rate is uh, perhaps one of the highest, 300. The population per available hospital bed, uh, you can see the difference. Assam is 3,062. 
and not to speak of uh, the minor indicators like the kind of out-of-pocket expenses that a patient has to have on hospitalization, both at urban centers, referral centers, or at primary health centers. The population served per doctor, the doctor population ratio again is uh, pretty high. So we need more doctors, more hospitals, more infusion in the health sector. Now this again is goal three of the SDGs, good health and well-being. I'm just showing you a comparative this thing with baselines. We have a lot to be done. Now, like when, when we do try to uh, travel with how you plan for health sector interventions. Now, as I mentioned, cancer again is one major debilitating factor here. And uh, the diagnostics uh, for the remarkably higher incidence of cancer doesn't match up to the actual extent of how much the disease is. And it bleeds the economy because a lot of individuals who are in, in, in their contributing capacities are let down by such a debilitating disease. As I mentioned already, high cost of hospitalization, doctor to population ratio, and the number of beds, etc. Now, the research findings, I just wanted to showcase a small ins instance. Say, for instance, uh, Upper Assam, the metal and mortality ratio is uh, around uh, 404 as compared to the state average of 300. Now, wh why is it higher in these Upper Assam areas was it took us time to zero down and find out that it was remarkably higher in the tea garden areas. Now, the tea garden areas were insular areas where government benefits and schemes were not reaching. The, the, uh, you know, the labor was inward looking and would not reach out uh, to be beneficiaries actively for government schemes. So we, we have to devise interventional schemes which are very specific. So possible interventions we worked out is a mobile medical unit that does a periodic visit to the tea gardens you have public-private partnership in these areas, and, and thanks to Government of India, the viability gap funding, there can be n number of such structured interventions which financially would not be so much of a strain in reaching out these services. Quality education, you can again see that uh, based on the average, we are uh, generally, Northeast and Assam are generally at the bottom. Shyam, can I intervene? Sir. Could you? I will, I will, sir. So the, uh, as, as Sarah has already uh, flagged the shortage of time, because this, this development story is much, much larger, but I will basically run down, the, can have a look at the slides, uh, and uh, then come down to the last part. Uh, this is something I wanted to speak to. 40% of the area of the state is not covered by mobile coverage, so we have an issue with connectivity. And uh, having said all this, Basically, I will come down to just this one slide. Now, what we have done is, government is now coming out with an outcome budget, as in each major head, and how do we map it to the outcomes that are related to bridging these social gaps. Now, my submission is this, before I wind up. The first is that externally aided projects provide us the relevant good quality of money to spend because the capital creation and the nature of expenditure is not uh, less revenue centric and more capital creation based. The second thing is Government of India in its benign dispensation has allowed us 90% of the funds as, as a loan which they bear and 10% is what the states outgo in terms of payments is. So it's uh, favorable to the states and if we look at our debt to GDP ratio, we are one of the lowest, Assam is one of the lowest, so we have that fiscal space to borrow more and effectively deploy more. I would request more and more interventions with only a rider that as much of the investment is there in the social structure, it acts as a ready multiplier to ensure inclusive development and inclusive growth throughout, and that eventually contributes to the speed, the speed at which we are able to translate infrastructure projects. I'm thankful for the time, and I would like to conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sham. I'm, I'm sorry I had to cut, him sh cut you short. You had made an excellent presentation. May I now request Mr. Yadav to make his intervention.
Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I am going to make a brief presentation on what the uh, Ministry of Railway is doing to develop the infrastructure facility, particularly railway infrastructure in this part of the country. If you see some time till some time back, uh, most of the rail infrastructure was limited to the state of Assam. Then Ministry of Railway has taken a mission to connect the capitals of all northeastern states, all the eight states of this region. And with this, we have few other goals also, like uh, we were having number of meter gauge lines. So all these lines, we plan that we will convert them into broad gauge. Then to provide faster connectivity to northeast by doubling of railway line. And the most busiest part of our track was from New Jalpai Guri to Blounding. It's about 650 kilometer uh, length. So this work we have taken. Then we are also working on some of the long-term strategic requirements, particularly some requirements have come from the Ministry of Defense as well. So that also we are working on. <coughs> then of course, avenues for international connectivity, particularly to Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Now if you see the present status of what I have just said, the mission area, the goals we have identified for ourselves. Uh, so far, we have been able to connect. Of course, Assam was already connected through a broad gauge, uh, capital of Assam. Now we have been able to connect uh, uh, capital of uh, Arunanchal Pradesh, that is Itanagar. We have constructed a line up to Nahar Lagoon, which is uh, just uh, about 12 kilometers away from Itanagar. It was not possible to go up to Itanagar because suddenly hills are very high. And similarly, we have been also able to connect uh, capital of uh, Tripura, that is Agartala. Of course, we are taking this line further to the southernmost part of the state of Tripura, that is up to Sabroom, from where Chitgong will be only about 75 kilometer, and uh, in fact, NHI is also planning uh, a road bridge uh, over River Feni. So once these two things are connected, Chitgong will be fairly, fairly close, maybe two hour journey. Now if you see uh, the progress of these projects, uh, uh, as I said, Arunanchal, Tripura, these two are connected. Manipur, a line is being constructed from Jeribam to Imphal. It is about 110 kilometer line through a hilly terrain. It's a very, very difficult terrain and work is progressing very well. Similarly to Aizol, to connect Aizol, we are taking a line, 52 kilometer line from Bhairavi to Sairang. Sairang is around 18 kilometers from Aizal. Again, the hills are very high after Sairang, so we are restricting to uh, Sairang. Then Kohima, Dimapur to Jubja. Jubja is again very close to Kohima, so this line is about 91 kilometers. This is again under construction. And then to connect Silong, capital of Meghala, we have taken two projects. One is Tetalia to Bernihat, which is in fairly advanced stage. And from Bernihat to Silang also we have taken this project. There are some issues we are trying to solve with the help of state government. So that will come. In Sikkim, so far we have no uh, rail network in that state. But we have planned a 45 kilometer line from Sevak to Rangpo. And from Rangpo to Gangtok, of course, that work will be probably taken in second phase. So these, all these capital connective works are now in progress. Uh, there are certain issues, we will not go into those details here. Now in the re recent four or five years, we have been able to convert almost uh, more than 900 kilometers of meter gauge line to broad gauge. And with this, uh, uh, say as on March uh, 17, we are having no meter gauge line in the entire northeast part and no meter gauge operation is taking place. So everything is now broad gauge. Uh, Coming to the improving the uh, mobility on our uh, northeastern corridor, we have taken a 469 kilometer doubling project, which is from New Jalpaiguri to Lamding. In fact, if you see, this is New Jalpaiguri and this is Lamding. From Lamding, all the northeastern southern states like Tripura, Manipur, Mizoram, they have to be served. And this line also goes towards Nagaland. So this part we are making a double line so that we can increase the speed of trains. So this work has again been taken up probably in next uh, 
three years we are trying to complete the whole stretch. If you see the total kitty of projects what we are having over Northeastern Railway, uh, there are 30 sanction projects, 18 for new line, 5 for gauge conversion, of course these have been completed and doubling 7 projects. And the overall cost of all these projects when they were sanctioned, the estimated cost is of the order of 89,000 crore, out of which we have is spent almost 40,000 crore. That's why we have been able to complete these five uh, gauge conversion projects. Some of the three new line projects have also been completed. And the balance kitty at the moment for northeastern states is around 50,000 crore. So these works are going and we are having allotment of the order of 5,000 to 7,000 every year. This just shows the importance which is being given by Ministry of Railway to Northeast. If you see the fund allotment over the years, there have been sharp increase in last three, four years. And that's why number of activities have increased and we have been able to commission more and more lines. So in all these years, uh, last four, five years, there have been sufficient allotment of fund of the order of 5,000 to 6,000 crores. And similarly, once we have this kind of fund allotment, sustained funding, uh, the pace of uh, commissioning of lines, new lines, gauge conversion lines that have also increased. If you see year 2015-16 or 16-17, uh, really massive uh, laying of railway lines of the order of 400 kilometers, 300 kilometers in one year. This slide just shows what we have planned for next three years, which will be, say, 18, 19. We have planned about 288 kilometers. The next year, around 254 kilometers and 324 kilometers. These are, most of them are going to be new lines and doubling because there is no gauge conversion now left. If you see major achievements, these are some of the lines we have been able to connect uh, with construction of Dudni Medipathar. Now, we have a footprint in state of Meghalaya, Harmati Nahar Lagoon, this was uh, again connecting to Arunanchal Pradesh, then Kumar Ghat Agartala, which uh, we were able to connect capital of Tripura, then Agartala Santi Bajar, this is again going on in full swing, and some of these projects are there. The, one of the most important was Lamding Silchar, this was a very, very difficult project, and with gauge conversion of this project, we have been able to open the doors to Barak Valley and all the southern uh, states in this area. These are some of the uh, uh, achievements in last four years, like all states of Northeast region, except Sikkim is now brought on busy rail, rail network. Then Arunachal Pradesh and Tipra, as I told, they are now connected. Barak Valley of Assam, connected with major cities of the country through Beji connectivity and conversion of entire meter gauge line. If you see the average annual commissioning of Beji lines has been uh, almost 3.2 times in last four years. Average annual commissioning, if you comp compare this with the previous four years. And this has been possible because fund allotment has almost doubled, more than doubled during these periods. Then we are also constructing a massive bridge, rail come road bridge across river Brahmaputra at Bogeyville. And there are 41 girders of 125 meter each. They all have been launched. And this is in fairly advanced stage. We are expecting to complete the entire work by July this year. <coughs> Tunneling is another major activity because most of our capital connectivity new lines are through hilly terrain and we have to do a lot many tunneling. So, so far in last four, five years, we have been able to complete about 65 kilometer tunneling in these projects. These are some photographs of inaugural functions held in north eastern part of the country. <coughs> this is the Bogeybill Bridge I was talking. Now all the girders have been completed. This is a very unique bridge. For the first time uh, in Indian Railways, we are using completely welded girders. There are no rivets and this has also helped us reduce the cost by about 20 percent. This design we uh, did with the help of uh, Denmark 
their help was taken. The tunneling, as I said, we are doing large number of tunneling. We are having, in, if we uh, take the all sanctioned projects, we have to do about 170 kilometers of tunneling in the so far sanctioned projects, and we have completed about uh, 65 kilometers. It's a very, very challenging geological conditions here. We have falling uh, of slopes and falling of excavated mass. So here we have to use really uh, very advanced kind of technology, which is known as new Austrian method of tunneling. It is a state of the art technology. We are having modern machines. <coughs> then in Manipur project, uh, that is to connect the capital of uh, Manipur, we are having very deep valleys and deep gorges, which we have to bridge. And one of the bridges is going to be 141 meter tall. And that is going to be the tallest uh, uh, girder bridge throughout the world. Earlier this was with the Montenegro bridge, that was 139 meter, now this will be the tallest bridge. This is being constructed near Noni in one of the most uh, earthquake prone area. These are some of the photographs of construction activity of this bridge. In fact, in certain part of the states like uh, uh, Tripura, soil condition is extremely poor, they cannot take directly, they cannot take the train load. So we are trying to improve the soil bearing capacity. We are using some very specialized methods to drain out the water from inside the soil, say up to 10-15 meter depth and improve the bearing capacity of the soil. So these kind of techniques we are using. We are also using geogrids kind of thing to improve the bearing capacity of the soil. Now we are also, during our construction, these were uh, technological part, but during our construction we are also trying to use local art and culture form in our various uh, uh, construction structures and uh, railway premises. Like this is Agartala building, which is depicting architecture of this building has been taken from the one of the palace, which is in Agartala. <laughs> Then we have done very good lighting at this station. If you see in the night, it's really very pleasing. Uh, some, local, some local dance farm has been put in the premises of this station. These are again at some other station, Ambasa. Then some paintings local, using the local people. So we are doing some uh, survey for strategic line. These surveys have been sanctioned. In fact, four lines have been identified uh, as a strategic line. One is from Jammu to Leh via Kargil, and three are in the northeastern part. The one of them, the important one, is from Misamari, Tenga, Tawang. So this survey we have started. This is going to be uh, passing through Sela Pass, and uh, most uh, of the length, uh, uh, road length is around 260 or 270 kilometer, but railway line is going to be around 165 kilometer, and about 80 percent of this line is going to be through tunnels. So this study is going, the work is yet not sanctioned, but the survey, final location survey is sanctioned, and that is what we are doing. Funding is being done by Ministry of Defense for these three projects. These are the basically lines, one is going to up to Tawang, Another is to Alo. Here again, defense infrastructure is there. And third line is to the easternmost part of the country. That is through Rupai, Teju, and Parasramkun. There are so many other surveys also to connect smaller cities. Uh, in fact, 24 surveys are in progress to connect smaller townships in different states. So they are again in progress. Now, Coming to international connectivity, what uh, railway is uh, doing, we already have, with Bangladesh, we already have connectivity at three places. One is through Gede, another is to Singabad, and uh, Radhikapur Birol recently we uh, completed this work. So these three connectivities are available and trains are going through them. And further uh, connectivity is planned, which is a new line from Agartala to Akhara. It's a 15 kilometer line. 5 kilometer in Indian portion, 10 kilometer in Bangladesh. So this work is physically going on. Then Haldibari, Chitali, we have completed work in Indian portion. Bangladesh is progressing. 
Then connectivity with Bhutan, so far we don't have any rail connectivity with Bhutan, but some survey has four, from four or five locations we have done feasibility studies. And whenever this work gets sanctioned, probably they will take off. Another connectivity to Nepal, we are having a line under construction from Jogbani to Biratnagar. It's about 18.6 kilometer line. Five and a half kilometer is in Indian portion. So this work is also progressing very well, except some problem is there with land acquisition in Nepal portion. So that is being sorted out. <laughs> then there is some uh, thinking for trans-Asian rail network, uh, which is known as TAR. Southern corridor of this network is from Kunming to Bulgaria. It's about 11,000 kilometer, passes through China, Thailand, Myanmar, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. On the eastern side, this TAR link enters India at Tamu, Myanmar, so about 100 kilometer from Imphal. So till Imphal, we are already connecting line. And uh, from Tamu to More, yes, we have to do. On the western side, of course, it enters at Atari, in Pakistan. So this is trans-Asian rail network, if we connect this part which is missing, basically if you see the missing part, in India it is basically uh, uh, Jiribam to Imphal, we are already doing this line and once this line is connected up to Imphal, then the missing link will be only from uh, Imphal to More, which is about 111 kilometer. We have done a complete uh, survey for feasibility of this line. The cost of this project would be somewhere around 5,500 crore. And on Myanmar side, the missing link will be Tamu to Kale, it's uh, 135 kilometer. We have said we can depute the rights for this survey. Now this depends upon the uh, decision taken at the mean level. Now gentlemen, as I said, we are doing large number of projects and uh, we have our own share of problems. Just to give you a look, uh, sometime we have delay in land acquisition because of local bodies and issues raised by them. Then road connectivity, particularly during monsoon month, is very, very poor. So that delays or hinders our progress. Then the terrain is hilly. Monsoon periods are longer. And the most difficult part is geology is very weak. We have large number of landslides during monsoon. So mostly now we are going in our projects through tunnels and through bridges. We are trying to avoid high cuttings so that the line remains operational throughout the year. And of course, uh, in some part of the country, particularly the eastern state like Manipur, we are having some problems of militancy and... Uh, Mr. Mr. Yadav, could, could you conclude now? Well. So this is just to give you what we are doing for the North East. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for more or less keeping the time. Would I now request Ms. Hala Mahar Kadumi to make her intervention? Your ten minutes. Hello, good morning. Um, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words on behalf of the World Bank and, and uh, to be here with you to discuss these, these very interesting, interesting theme. Um, my presentation is actually going to be very short. There's no presentation as such. Um, I just wanted to offer a few reflections on mm -hmm. some of the ideas that uh, were discussed uh, yesterday and today and uh, some of the work the World Bank is doing to, to begin to address these, these issues in conjunction with other 
uh, with various governments, uh, state governments and, and the central government, in addition to coordination with other development partners. So as we heard um, yesterday and today, um, the region as a whole has uh, largely missed out on the development opportunities uh, and progress that we've seen in other parts uh, of, of India. And um, we've heard about the human d development uh, ratings on various various accounts, the SDGs, the, 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 the progress in meeting the SDGs. So the picture is not a, a good one. Um, however, that said, uh, the Northeast has a number of attributes that could make it a power the, a powerhouse of India and, and the engine of growth not only uh, in in, not only in, in, uh, for the Northeast, but also for, for the, the larger country as a whole. It's got a rich cultural heritage, vast natural resources, particularly water resources. Um, the Brahmaputra Basin is, a, is an enormous resource, one of the few open basins in the country, meaning that uh, water availability is far greater than current demands. So there's, there's enormous opportunity for uh, development for productive use. Um, it has one of the highest levels of biodiversity in South Asia and in, in, in the world, in, in fact. It has a high untapped potential for hydropower, significant opportunities for improving inland water transport that would help it to uh, address the connectivity issues that were discussed uh, today and yesterday. And as we all know, it's strategically placed to serve as a vital gateway uh, to, the, to the southeast and beyond, and a, the potential to, to develop into a, a major tourism hub. So seeing this massive potential, but also recognizing the challenges, uh, the World Bank has, uh, has been in investing, supporting uh, the Northeast in a number of sectors uh, over a few decades. Uh, these range from water resources to agriculture to inland water transport. Uh, just to name a few of the projects that we have uh, in the pipeline or ongoing, uh, the National Hydrology Project, which is actually pan-Indian, um, the Assam Integrated River Basin Management Project, which is uh, just beginning. It's in, in, in early stages of preparation. Um, the Assam Inland Water Transport Project, which is primarily dealing with passenger, improving passenger ferry services. Uh, the Assam Agri Ag Agribusiness and Rural Transformation Project, which actually is the third in the line of, of projects that's, that have been going on for decades in the agricultural sector. The North Reg Northeast Region Power Systems Improvement Project, Swachh Bharat, which is also Pan-Indian, Pan and a Rural uh, Livelihoods Project in Meghalaya. Uh, we're also uh, in discussion with the various Northeast states on potential opportunities uh, in, in, for, for future, uh, future in, for, for deeper engagement. Um, we're also supporting the states in, uh, through technical assistance. And I'd like to just mention one effort that's going on now, uh, which is uh, under the uh, High Level Committee for the Proper Management of Water Resources in the Northeast. So this is actually a, a committee that was set up uh, at the directive of the Prime Minister's office to, uh, to explore uh, the potential for reducing the risks in the region and also making more productive use of, of, of the vast water resources. And so we're working with the, the, the center and the states to uh, undertake a rapid assessment that would lead to uh, recommendations for immediate action, but also longer term, uh, longer term work. So that's just one example of the types of TA that we're that we're support technical assistance that we're supporting in in the region. Um, now, through these projects, we've tried to address various constraints, um, and this is actually the message that uh, I think if you take one message, it's not what the World Bank is doing in, 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 in the Northeast, but it's, it's, it's the areas that we're trying to address, which could provide food for thought. Um, we call these uh, the three I's. 
So this is institutions, information, and infrastructure. Um, and I'll just go through each one of these very, very quickly. Um, so I think we are all quite uh, aware of the fact uh, and can agree that there is actually limited uh, capacity in the region. In fact, it was mentioned yesterday that uh, financial support is needed for sure, but there's also an issue of absorption capacity. And um, there is limited coordination across various agencies that uh, should be working together for integrated uh, planning and, and development. Uh, skills uh, need strengthening. Uh, and there is, there's, there's some institutional reforms might need to be put in place in order to realize the synergies between these various, these various agencies. In addition, there's the uh, interstate uh, coordination issue and the coordination issue between the states and the, the Northeast states and the central government. So we have a, our country director has a saying, which is don't fix the pipes, fix the institutions that fix the pipes. And so this is actually a, a huge area of, of, of focus for, for us uh, and, and one of and features in, in many of our projects and is actually the objective of our technical assistance as well. Um, this, means skill, not, this means skilling people. This means, uh, as I said, reforming institutions um, and thinking in terms of sustainability and, and long-term longevity. On the information front, um, we have a limited information base that does not allow for decision making that's based on sound science. Uh, that varies across sectors, but I would like to give as one example, um, again, the water resources sector, which is my, <laughs> my sector. Um, here, uh, there, there's an enormous amount of information on, on the Brahmaputra River. Uh, but it's dispersed, it's scattered. Um, there's a lack of data and or n lack of sharing of data that does exist. And this is, this is, this is a major constraint. So one of the areas of, of, of focus for the bank is improving the, the knowledge base and, uh, and, and, and building a scientific basis for, for more informed um, decision making. And finally, on investments, infrastructure and investments, the last I. So uh, one, of the, um, one of the speakers said yesterday that infrastructure is a, is a necessary but not sufficient condition. So that's right. It's one of three, <laughs> uh, along with institutions and information. Um, but it is important. And uh, the, uh, it's not any investments. It's uh, actually integrated investments that cut across a multitude of sectors. And I'll just give one example um, on agriculture that was mentioned uh, yesterday. It's not just bringing irrigation to farmers. It's bringing irrigation, electricity, cold storage, ra railways, ha uh, roads, Inland water transport to farmers so that they, they can actually they can actually uh, building those value chains, um, and that's not trivial. It means working across a range of sectors. Uh, another example is um, inland water transport. So just to 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 give an idea of the potential here, and perhaps this was discussed in in an earlier session that I missed yesterday, but. It's quite striking that out of 111 declared national waterways in India, in the entire country, 20 lie in the northeast region. Out of these, 15 lie in Assam. So the state actually has the largest network of navigable waterways in the country. And that's not been tapped. Uh, but developing these systems is requires overcoming issues that are typically within the purview of water resources management. So dealing with floods, dealing with erosion, dealing with sedimentation. So again, we have to work outside of the siloed approach. 
um, and and also thinking about multi-model transport. So we heard about the railways today, we heard about roads yesterday, uh, linking those with, with inland water transport to improve connectivity in the region and in, in the whole, so uh, as a whole. So with those uh, few thoughts, um, I promise to make it short. Uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity and uh, look forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kadumi, for sticking to the time up to the last minute. Now, may I request Mr. Sri Savichachi Datta for his intervention. This coming? Yeah. Good morning, uh, and uh, a special thanks to uh, RIS and uh, and Fiki for giving me the chance to uh, share a few thoughts with you. Uh, it's really uh, heartening to see uh, such an initiative. Uh, for long, we have been hearing and talking about. Uh, how do we connect this region uh, physically? But what's also very important and how do we connect it uh, with social infrastructure? And kudos to the organizers for taking up this very, very important theme. And I would like to make a special mention that my presence here today is itself uh, uh, a recognition of the farsightedness of the organizers to involve uh, players like us in the civil society uh, who, uh, who operate, as we call, in the third space, and I will talk a little bit more about that. But today, um, in keeping with the constraints of time, uh, with the chair, um, I would like to talk a little bit about how do we weave people together in, along, with, along with the infrastructure that we're talking about. Um, something wrong here? Um, Asian Confluence, uh, just uh, very briefly, is an institution uh, which is relatively new. We are about five years old, but uh, dedicated to, to complementing uh, this narrative around connectivity at a people level. And we work at uh, various levels, but uh, with the very idea that people must see the value of being connected. Let's not forget that the region which we are talking about and my previous speakers uh, very wonderfully brought out the historical components. Um, we lie at the cusp of South and Southeast Asia. We have uh, the large economies of, uh, on the North, on the, on the Southeast, on the West, and the large ocean to the South. You know, uh, uh, if we combine this region, uh, these states along with our immediate neighbors. And there's a lot of potential for that that has been spoken about. Um, but I'd also like to highlight the fact that the region is naturally connected. My previous speaker uh, spoke about the number of waterways uh, that are here in this region. The region is a natural mountain to sea uh, contiguity. Uh, and pre-1950, uh, the rivers used to be actually the major connector of the region. So we are naturally connected. We are also historically connected. Uh, and a lot has been spoken about that, and I, in the interest of time, I'll not get into that, except to say that probably if a little more investigation into history shows that if we, if we really look at this region at the cusp of South and Southeast Asia, there were many, many linkages in the past. Um, but uh, a more recent narrative has, post-partition has arisen, and the region has been divided. And even the states of the Northeast are relatively new, born out of many 
politics of identities and, uh, and, and divisions of, uh, you know, uh, uh, and many agitations. But, so perhaps uh, this naturally contiguous region, uh, historically connected, geographically connected, naturally connected, but uh, interspersed and divided by many borders, and when I say borders, not just physical borders, but also mental borders. We have many psychological divides in this part of the country. And probably that is also something that needs to be addressed. Um, I have, I'm basically a systems engineer. And uh, I want to draw a little bit of my learnings from my avatar as designing and building large systems. When we are talking about connecting the Northeast and connecting South and Southeast Asia, and if we take a systemic view, we have to see what are the inputs we are giving to what systems and what are the outputs we are getting. And to recognize that, we have to see what is the basic nature of the system we are operating on, who are the major players. And in that, I'd like to say that I've, for the sake of you know, logical brevity, I've divided the spaces of engagement. The first space of space engagement is, of course, the government. And we have heard over the last two days and the, the, the large number of initiatives that the government has taken, both at the federal level and the state level. And it's very nice to see how the state and federal initiatives are now being aligned to build infrastructure, treaties, you know, security apparatus, and all of it. And that's wonderful. Um, and then we have the chambers and the business community who are also getting aligned to this connectivity. Uh, there are talks of creating value chains and we heard a lot about that yesterday. And uh, you know, uh, there are again treaties in place. There is a BIMSTEC free trade agreement which is right now on, on the rocks, on the books. <laughs> and then there, was, there are many other things going on. Uh, the fact that the World Banks and other multilateral agencies are getting involved is a welcome sign. But there is another space, which I would say is, forms a very big part, uh, which is the people space. I'm very happy to see here a large number of students and, and, and young ladies and, and you know, here from, I think kudos to the organizers for, for, for making that happen. Because this space of small entrepreneurs, budding academics, SMEs, individual players, champions, individual champions in government, in business, who have this larger vision or an interest in connecting, has to be nurtured further. And those bonds, beyond the borders of states and international territory, have to be at the level of the mind and emotion. You know, let's not forget that if Tripura Palatana plant was a success today with a major collaboration between India and Bangladesh, it was also a large part because of the personal bonds of friendship that people at a personal level had to, to enable something that happened. And these are the kind of champions that I think as we look further into the investments and capital investments that are going on in the region, there is a need for institutions to nurture what we call this third space. Nurture the social capital of, of, our, of our people. There are many people here who have friends and family and, and you know, who reach out to people in other parts of the region and other countries in, in the region they can become the champions of this connectivity and show the benefits of this connectivity. And I think there is a need for championing, a, a, making a champions group who can translate the work that is happening to tangible and to the minds and hearts of people. Um, and, and therefore, this operating system of this third space, as I would like to call it, which is the people-led space, is trust. People must take ownership of the connectivity projects. Uh, my, my, my senior colleague here before who spoke about me talked about you know, the, some of the roadblocks that uh, come on the way in infrastructure projects. It's probably because people don't want to trust 
the benefits of those projects on the ground. What is it going to do? Uh, that translation needs to happen, I think, more and more. And so I would like to talk a lot today about trust in the little time that I have left. So it's not just about geoeconomics and geopolitics, but also to bind people in a sort of a geophilosophical aspect. What is it that binds us all this connectivity, this development, what does it mean for me, my identity, my community? Because you must, this region is a diversity hotspot, but people really care for uh, what it means. People are attached to their land, their identities. And it's high time that that attachment to the land and identity and their culture is not at odds with the connectivity narrative. It must become in sync. Um, so I, at Asian Confluence, as we call ourselves, we, we call the region a confluence of Asia's because it is really a region where uh, many of the Asia's come together. There's huge amount of diversity in, in, uh, in the level of culture, food, thought, you know, and, and how does this all align to uh, the development course of the future? And how do we baggage, shed the baggage of of the partition of the past. It's so for so trust is the understructure for trade, transport, and if we include traditions and preserving them and the technologies that are going to come in. I'd like to end by proposing a model. So you know uh, you, we are investing capital into developing assets. But I propose, and I think that this is being increasingly recognized, that this capital investment must be in two orthogonal fronts. One is creating physical and human capital assets, but also in creating social capital assets. How can, peop how can we invest in people becoming votaries and champions of a more connected future? Uh, so there is a lot of talk, and these two are orthogonal, and I'd like to paint a picture very briefly. So on one dimension, there's physical infrastructure, roads, rails, inland waterways, and I think we have to look at, at that level, intrastate, interstate, and international connectivity working in tandem. And it's work in progress. It's very heartening to see the kind of work that is being done by, we heard about inland waterways, roads, airports, and it's, I think, work in progress. The second thing is, this region is ecologically a very, very sensitive and connected region. It's, it holds a unique mountain to sub-Himalayan, it connects the Himalayas to the Indian Ocean, to the Bay of Bengal essentially, and it makes it a very unique mountain to see. And it was very heartening to see how the governments are addressing the SDG goals uh, in, in the, you know, how can we address things like agriculture, aqu aquaculture, horticulture. So that's again work in progress. I think a policymaker from the government of Assam recently, and, and I know in the several other governments cite the example of Sikkim, I think they've taken a great lead on that. So that's again a great, how do we deal with disaster? That's another issue, which is, I think, uh, you know, a lot of work has been done, is being done. There's also a lot of spending happening on so-called social infrastructure, which is hospitals, education, sanitation, Swachh Bharat, you know, Sarv Siksha, all of that, uh, livelihood, tourism. But there is the other dimension to it, which I would like to point out with vertical lines, which is the other dimension. And I think this, this list, which is which you see this list of stripes, has to be complemented and woven together by we have to see how we can develop ultra-local human capital right at the root. It's not enough to just give education. We have to give knowledge. We have to give vision at the very grassroots. I'm just back from a Reiki of the borders between India and Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, it's... We need to shed more lights into the remote areas because there are, there are, there's innate intelligence there. So cutting edge schools, cutting edge education, the top notch contemporary thoughts and ideas 
with technology today, it's possible to do that. And at Asian Confluence, we, a lot of our programs do focus on that, and I'd love to, we'd love to engage further on that. Second is social capital development. How can individuals who have large social capital, when I mean social capital, and there are a large number of students here, you know, a person, the more people you know, and not on Facebook, but the more people who command your thoughts, your respect, that's our social capital. Uh, Facebook is a very superficial idea of it. We think we have many followers on Facebook, so a lot, the whole world is listening. It's not true. The latest research shows it's not true. Uh, but social capital in itself is a very, very powerful idea. And how young people who have large social capital, how young leaders or le local leaders with large social capital can become champions and votaries for this connectivity narrative. I think that's something that we need to invest in. There need to be often, I think, uh, the discourse on connectivity remains stuck. And uh, uh, third is uh, crowdfunded capital. Why don't we look into projects which are crowdfunded? There's a large number of uh, aspects. Um, how much time do I have? Two more minutes, sir? Your time is over. Oh, okay. You can finish it. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, entrepreneurship, dispute resolution services, and uh, uh, trade facilitation services. I think if we had these kind of institutions uh, going forward, a lot more could be achieved to build more trust on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank, I'm sorry thank for you. the thank, 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 thank you very much, Mr. Datta. It's very interesting. May I now request Mr. Otajit Shetri Manyun to make his intervention. Respected Chair, uh, everyone on the dais, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's indeed my privilege to be here at Guwahati. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, RIS and Fiki for inviting me to be part of this event. And uh, since I'm talking about social integration, so I'm going to integrate morning and afternoon. So it's about to be 12 o'clock. Uh, well, uh, since yesterday, we have been discussing a lot on connectivity, on various infrastructures, development on road, on waterways, on aviation. So today, I will be touching upon a very significant uh, issue on skilling, on skill development. Uh, so as you know, like the basic foundation of skill development policy in India, so as you are aware that Below 5% of the total workforce in India has undergone formal skill training, and that's really, really a fact. And if you talk about, again, the informal economy or the informal workers who are really vulnerable, and that means they, they, mean they, be, they are being part of that vulnerable group already. So we have a huge human de development deficit like, due to lack of education and skills. Basically, when you talk about the informal workers, the unorganized workers. So when we talk about the Northeast region as such, we have around 84% of the total workforce in India or the uh, Northeast region belonging to either self-employed or casual waste workers. So we have a very huge proportion of this set of workers who are unorganized, who are informal. And that is basically a big challenge for all of us, the policymakers, the government, the, 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 the NGOs, the civil societies have really uh, have to play a very significant role in this in order to bridge this gap. So with this foundation, like the government of India has come up with a new policy on skill development way back in 2009 that is called the National skill, uh, Policy on Skill Development. And due to the fact that the demographic dividend that we enjoy, that we are the youngest country in the world, and other factors like economic and social factors, and with that, NSDC was involved in the year 2009, and in the year 2013, we have this NSDA, the, uh, the National Skill Development Agency, which is trying to like, coordinate with all the various skill development programs and schemes that is being run by different ministries and, diff in, in, and in different states of the country. And there's a new ministry which has been developed, which has been involved to look after these various social uh, uh, schemes, uh, skill development schemes in the country, 
with the setting up of this Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship way back in 2014. And the new policy, policy has come up with the addition of entrepreneurship in the National Skill uh, Development Policy in 2015. And well, friends, like you have been hearing a lot about Skill India, Skill Mission. So basically, the aims and objective of this Skill India is to train 400 million people in India by the year 2022. That's why the every state government, even in the Northeast also, we have this Skill Development Mission. So most of the states have already uh, uh, constituted their Skill Development Missions. But when you talk about the skill gap mapping in the country, based on the findings of the National Skill Development Corporation's various surveys they have done in all over the countries, all the states of the country, and the interesting features that we have come across is that majority of the states have surplus supply of minimally skilled manpower. When you talk about three skill sets, skill, semi-skill, and minimally skilled manpower, and it's very surprising to see that majority of the states in India have surplus supply of minimalist skilled manpower. What does it indicate? It indicates that there is a need for creating infrastructure, better inf uh, infrastructure and facilities for self employment. Because as I said, in the regular employment sector, we have hardly around 18% or 7% of the total workforce in India are in the organized sector. So this indicates that here we are talking about building physical infrastructures, so definitely it also implies that we really need to really look from this perspective also how we have to increase the skill manpower in the country. And another features that we have come across is most of the reasons in India have deficit of skill and semi-skilled workers. So definitely we have to take into consideration this, okay, so that means we have deficit, we have lack of supply of skill and semi-skilled workers. And interestingly again, when we talk about the Northeast region as such, what interesting features have come up is the region has surplus supply of skill, semi-skill, and minimally skilled manpower. That is a different trajectory from the man, what you call the mainland India. So it is very interesting to see that we have a surplus of skilled manpower or human resources in the region. And that's why when we try to look at the policy, when we try to look at the formulation of policy at the central level, we really need to consider, okay, for notice, it's a little bit different from the mainstream, what, or the mainland India, when you talk about skill development as such, because we really have to focus on this perspective of skill upgradation, new skills, and specialized skills. Because we have a surplus, so what we need to look at is the, how to upgrade these skills, how to uh, in, uh, introduce new skill set so that the youths are engaged in employment skills and definitely they get some kind of employment opportunities. And definitely when you talk about the surplus supply of labor, definitely they cannot find livelihood or they cannot fly, find jobs in the region. So they have to move out. So there is a train of youths moving out from the region, working in various parts of the states of India. When you come across the Bangalore incident where thousands and thousands of people from the north, especially from Assam, they came back to the region again. And when you talk about the target group segmentation, so this is very significant when we talk about uh, developing some kind of a scheme or project or policy, we really have to see how we can segmentize this t target group in the form of dropouts, out of college, engineering skills in uh, college, degree or PG in college, in service trade, farmers and allied workers, artisans, different uh, handlooms and handicrafts who are involved in that, how we can uh, devise a strategy to empower them by skilling them. And we have a lot many women, like in the Northeast, women are empowered in the sense that, like if you talk about Imphal as such or Manipur as such, like women are the movers, economic movers in the society. So we really have to see how women can be empowered or how self-employed people can be empowered through skilling. And we have different uh, approaches to skilling, like we can have short term, we can have intermediate term, we can have long term, and we can have expanding segments, trying to uh, coordinate or converse with different uh, ministries and departments so that we can have a coordination or a convergence of these very skill development programs in the country or in the state. And one interesting facet that we have come across is about the youth aspiration and industry demand. 
and I will try to relate with the Northeast region. So this youth aspirations and infrastructure, infrastructure creation for skill development are very, very correlated. They are very interrelated. And there are gaps between this industry demand and youth aspirations. The youth wants something, but the industry wants something uh, different thing. So there is a major gap between the industrial demand, industry demand and the youth aspirations. So how do we bridge this gap? So there is a need for skill infrastructure and targeted student mobilization. That is the training mobilization through awareness campaigns and student interaction in sectors with high industry demand. And when you talk about Nordic specific point of discussion, we could see that in sectors like tourism, travel and hospitality and IT and ITES, there is a high youth aspirations and high industry demand. So we have to really target this particular sector where there is a possibility, there is a potential for employment generation, income generation, job creation. And where sectors with high industry demand and low aspirations are unorganized informal works that we do generally what we could see everywhere around in Guwahati or in Fal or in Agartala or in Shillong and agriculture and allied activities. And interestingly, what we could observe from the data is that agricultural sector, the growth of agriculture in the Northeast is not declining, it is negative growth. So this is something which we really, uh, really need to think about, ponder about. And yes, coming back to tourism in Northeast India and trying to relate with infrastructure and skill development, we could see that there is a supply chain when you talk about tourism sector as such. Transport to destination, ground transport, excursion, restaurants, lodging, tour operating, and transport to origin. So that means all this supply chain needs manpower, skill manpower. And when we talk about different forms of tourism in the region, we have heritage, wildlife, ecotourism, adventure tourism, and we really need a support system. That means without experience, expertise, skill manpower, we cannot have this kind of flourishing or effective tourism in the region. So we need people, we need trainers, we need training institutions. So what Ms. Hala was talking about, that means you don't teach, don't teach the people to fix the pipe. You try to fix the system which teaches the people to fix the pipe. So that's what I would like to apply here. So that means if definitely when we try to develop tourism in the region, we need to have this set of manpower. Without that, means a driver cannot be a guide, a driver cannot be all, all in one, multitasker. He will be the driver, he will be the cook, he will be the guide, he will every, 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 everything in everyone, in one. So we cannot have that kind of a like, you know, structure or strategies in the region. So in order to develop the tourism in this region, we need to have diversified men, skilled manpower. And as I said, there are sub-segments of tourism industry like hotels and restaurants, tour operators and travel industry. And regarding skill training, we could see that Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, and Ministry of Human Resource Development, they have different uh, uh, like training programs, training sets. Like for Ministry of Tourism, they have this Institute of Hotel Management, which are in Guwahati, Shillong, and Gangtok. So we just need to be expanded in other states of the country also. And existing training providers should be certified through a stringent process of enhance, to enhance their employability. That means those who have trained from this uh, institution, they should be employable. That means that the skills they have adopted or learned from the institute should be employable. So their empl employability skills should be imparted. So there has to be some kind of certification process should be very stringent now. Then training of trainers. So the problem that we have in the North is that we do not have trainers. I have experienced this, I have done some field work also. So the problem is that there is no trainer, there is no qualified trainers to train the students. So one teacher would be t uh, teaching different, different subjects, different trades. So that's the case in most of the IT, uh, ITS that we have in the region. So we really need to have training of trainers and, spe and specifically for that we need institutions which train these trainers. And coming back to the public-private partnership, what I have come across, this is one of the evaluation that I have done uh, multi-skill development centers, what this, is, uh, this was one of the centrally sponsored scheme which was, which had a pilot in Karnataka, Gulbarga and Bangalore. KGTTI means Karnataka German Technical Training Institution. This, this model is really working well in the sense that with the involvement of international knowledge partner like GIS, uh, GIZ, and the, uh, then the industry. So there is a close coordination between the government, the international partner, and the industry in designing the curriculum, the syllabus, and definitely, and training. 
So this model has really come out well, and it, now it has expanded to other parts of the Karnataka also, like in Hubli, Belgaum, Mangaluru, and also in, the, uh, in Bangalore also, they have these centers. So this was a model which really worked in the sense that the structure is in, in such a way that they have designed a mechanism to directly link with industry. So whatever the, the industry wants, they frame it as a part of the curriculum. So in that way, this model really works when you have that kind of a setup where industrial uh, uh, setups are there. Then skilling through CSR is one of the areas where we can look. This is one of the perspectives where we can engage companies, corporations in skill development. Because as you know, with the uh, new uh, Indian, uh, India uh, Ikrika Companies Act 2013, now CSR has become mandatory for the companies. So according to Section 135 of Chapter 9, so skill development has been incorporated as one of the activities of the CSR activities by different companies. So if we talk about the role of foreign companies, I'm not talking about Indian companies for now because I have worked on these areas. Role of foreign companies, basically the Korean companies like LG's, Samsung and Hyundai. And interestingly, 641 Korean companies are working in India, having an investment in India. And 86% are in the manufacturing sector. And if you talk about LG, Samsung, 40% of the market share are being controlled by LG Electronics and Samsung, and Hyundai, 19% of the automobile industry. So if you talk about Samsung technical schools, they are really working well. They have collaboration with MSME, and they have come out with MSME technical centers, and then collaboration with ITIs. And one ITI from the north is ITI Guwahati. So they have set up this Samsung technical schools in 10 ITS, including this ITA Guwahati. And LG and Hyundai Motors India Limited, they have partners with different ITS in the region. And ITA Guwahati, again, tied up with Hyundai Motor India Foundation. And this was the first educational institution for this skill development initiative in India. So I, ITA Guwahati is really like you know, collaborating with different agencies, even international agencies, international companies for the skill development program. And the, finally, the way forward, Interestingly, it is considered that ITS are the backbone of vocational training institutions in India. But interestingly, the scenario in the North is quite different. If you see, when you talk about regional development, because this is the topic of the event, when you talk about regional development, so we could see, this is an example, I'm just giving an example, because there are so many examples we can cite different, and since yesterday on, we have been discussing, discussing a lot on this, but one, thing that I could observe is on this skilling part. So there is a need to bridge this regional development, regional gap. In terms, when you see the data, like 4,310 people, persons in the Northeast region, there is one seat, the one ITI seat. But the national average is only 986. So there is a wide disparity when you talk about scaling, uh, skilling through ITIs which are considered to be the backbone of vocational training institution in India. And finally, skill development should be part of the social security net, providing decent work. You talk about investment, you talk about infrastructure development. Definitely we have to look from other perspective also, the workers, the people who are involved in the development infrastructure process, we should provide decent work and decent working conditions. And finally, Skilling people with employment and livelihood opportunities can bring social integration. We talk about road connectivity, we talk about water connectivity, but here I'm trying to argue that we can also integrate the entire region, the country, through skilling also. And finally, we should remember that ease of business should also lead to ease of living. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'll give the floor to myself for five minutes and then questions for 10 minutes. 12.30 will close. So friends, you have been very patiently listening to very useful interventions by the panelists here. If I can summarize them in two, three minutes, Mr. Shyam Jagannathan, he spoke about why the Northeast needs our special, why we need special assistance. Mr. Yadav gave a full overview of the railways here. Ms. Kadumi talked about the three I's, the institutions, information, and infrastructure and told us to fix the institutions and don't fix the pipes. We are in the business of fixing institutions. You must have been watching it. Mr. Datta talked about three spaces, social spaces, and talked about trust, building trust. Very important thing, very philosophical. 
and I wish we had more time to talk about them. Mr. Shetrimanyan, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and talked about scaling and talk, told us about the three S's. S's, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Surplus supply of skills in this region. So three I's and three S's are the take homes which I take from here. There is a big gap in ITIs. This is what the summary of the discussions here. For my two pence contribution, since I've been paid by Fiki to come here and go back, so if I go without saying that, it won't be fair on my part. So it comes from fixing of institutions. That's what I wanted to talk about. There are institutions, we fixed them after 91 reforms. If you remember, we used to have DFIs in India, development financial institutions. Somebody told us, what's the difference between DFIs and the banks? We fixed all those institutions and said the banks will do the job. And now we know where we stand. The banks are, banks don't know how to give long-term financing. They gave, you know, I don't have to say all those things. What's happening to public sector banks is partly, this is not my saying, so many people are saying so. Partly they're not being experienced enough to finance infrastructure, to finance, to give long term, to give term financing. And now we are back to creating the term lending financial institutions. AIIB is one example at the international level. And while coming here, I went through, there is a long term financial institution in Northeast, which gets about some, I think some 30 crores per year from the government of India, 30 or 33 crores per year from the government of India. And I, I went through the annual report. They are doing a good job. Their NPAs are about 10, about 20% or something, which is on the higher side, but every long-term lending financial institution has to face those problems. So one suggestion, as I said while coming here, could be we have new international institutions. We earlier had IDBI, SIDB, and others who used to term lend to these local financial institutions. I happen to had one 20 years back, or 20, maybe 20, almost 30 years back in Kerala, and most of the big infrastructure building which has happened in the last 20 years was seeded by this local term lending financial institutions. One way could be to give a line of credit from the international bank to these local institutions and build them further, give them more money. I know they have a problem in absorption. You have told us all the problems, but we have to break the circuit somewhere. There are projects by international financiers like the SASEC one which is the ADB is financing in a big way, and it has, it must have a very, very big part in the Northeast, because it's a very important cog in the whole scheme of things. So there are institutions which need fixing. There are institutions which do not need fixing. We have wrongly fixed a few institutions a few years, few decades back. I think we should build them. We should build them, we should support them, we all make mistakes, we learn from them, and I don't think we have more time for uh, talking about these things here, so I stop here. Next 10 minutes is for the audience to put questions to any of the panelists and their replies. Thank you. This is for uh, Mr. Jadab. India is expanding a railway system to Burma and Myanmar. Will there be any time reducing a free, free flow of traffic when there is so much of gauge difference? You can never foresee that Burma will go to broad gauge. And nobody, in fact, in the world uses broad gauge other than India. It's a highly defective gauge to draw railway tracks to the uh, hilly regions. Isn't it better to forget about this pan Asian railway like that? India will be, I think, the biggest bottleneck if there is a pan Asia railway system because of the gauge system, because of the gauge we have. What do you think, Mr. Jadab? Uh, I don't think gauge is a, a big issue because there are consequent, I, I hope everybody is able to hear me. Uh, there are consequent yards which are made whenever there is a change in gauge. So that kind of thing do happen, like when we are going to Akhara from uh, Agartala, we are making a dual gauge kind of system because most of the, their system is still in meter gauge. So that kind of thing will go. Now coming to the next part, uh, making lines in hill uh, may not be that uh, good. I don't think this is uh, uh, 
this is the right approach because we have to connect our uh, hills as well. Uh, if we have to provide mobility, uh, of course, roads are much faster to construct. Uh, railway line, constructing railway line through hills is fairly difficult, but there are lines uh, through hills as well. Like if you see Pune and Bombay getting connected through hills, so there is a very high hills and there are large many tunnels, but still we are running about 100, 110 pairs of train every day. So it, it requires some uh, uh, kind of special techniques, technology, those things are now available, so why not connect them? No, of course, uh, it's possible, but it will uh, uh, entail a very high cost. It, uh, we have to do it, there is no so, other way. So, so, sorry. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. I'm Shubhubrata Sharma from Guangdi Management Institution. So I want to know what is the position of uh, double track between Jogi Gupa of the uh, Bhaya Rongiya, that's Bhagai Gaon and Gohati Bhaya Rongiya. And another question, what is the actual positions of conversion this other line? This is Bhaya Jogi Gupa. And I have heard that there is a problem in laying the lines in the Jogi Gupa bridge itself. Because the, the, you, you may have to close the line for one or two months. And what is the position? Via Rangia, yes, gauge conversion, uh, double line work is sanctioned. In fact, we are going, we are going to have a bridge again parallel to the existing bridge near Sarai Ghat. So that bridge, at present, we are debating whether we should go again for a rail come road bridge because recently uh, highway has constructed one uh, road bridge. So that part we are taking care and uh, that work is sanctioned. The other loop, we are already in advanced stage of construction. So we want to just put a double line section between New Alipur Dwar to uh, Lumding because this is the network which is going to carry maximum traffic because after Lumding, we have to cater towards Dibrugar side, we have to cater towards Silchar side and beyond Silchar further to Manipur, Tripura and Mizoram. So keeping those kind of volumes in view, this uh, work of 650 uh, kilometer odd lines have been sanctioned for W. Now, how long it will take? Uh, we are expecting, uh, like last year, we opened about 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers. So another three years, this will get uh, converted. Thank you. I am Professor Milindo from RIS. I, I, I have one question to Mr. Datta. Uh, he very... Uh, uh, succinctly produce the uh, distinct space, three spaces in the context of the Northeast region. Uh, I have just one clarification that should these space work in silos or there should be a mechanism to lead to an interaction across these spaces? Thank you. No, absolutely. It's uh, the third space it actually gleans from the first two, plus. So definitely all three have to work together. Definitely. The lady. I'm a student from Tata Institute of Social Science, Guwahati. Uh, I would first like to thank Mr. Datta for addressing the student community out here. Uh, my question is, uh, if... Uh, Considering that we have the kind of uh, insurgency that has happened in Manipur and that cannot be actually be ignored when we talk about Northeast India, uh, if you could just throw light on the way ahead in order to work for development in the insurgency area, uh, considering, the, considering that we lack physical infrastructure and social infrastructure in these areas. Uh, I'm sorry if this would even take a little time, but just a few pointers if you could just help with a very loaded question, <laughs> but uh, very briefly, you know, uh, I think a person, a young person becomes an insurgent because of lack of opportunities. If a person gets opportunities, has a bigger vision of how those opportunities can give him or her access to new areas, avenues, you know, I don't think, I think that's the way forward. So. More and more people in the understand the value of connectedness, the value of connectivity. Uh, that's a step forward. There are other politics and other issues involved, which 
probably are being addressed, but you know, I don't want to get into those details right now. In the context of Manipur and Nagaland, definitely more and more people must understand that, you know, their future, the prosperity lies in the connected future rather than being isolated. The world is moving away from isolation, you know. So they have to understand this. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Gulshan. I divide my time between Darjeeling, Gangtok and Namchi. And my question is to Ms. Hala Maharma Kadumi, that these three towns have population of Namchi smallest about 30,000, 25, 30,000, Darjeeling about 1.5 lakhs and Gangtok about 1 lakh. And three to four water sources in the town and an amazing maze of GI pipeline network, which uh, in Gangtok is close to 3,500 kilometers. In Namchi, in small town, it is about 1,200 kilometers. Darjeeling, I am still not successful to measure it completely. One inch GI pipelines from the main water sources individually supplying to uh, buildings or households. Amazing amount of wastage of water. Is there a case? for World Bank uh, to uh, do something about it. And second question is to Dr. Otojit, my dear friend. Uh, the national average of availability of ITI or technical institution seats in Northeast is very less. But in Arunachal Pradesh, lot of seats are vacant because students only want to do civil engineering diplomas or trades related to civil engineering in order to get jobs into PWD or UDHD, construction related departments. Um, mechanical, electric, electronics, the seats lie vacant in ITIs. Uh, Dirang ITI is one, adopted by Tata's excellent faculty, but no takers for those seats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we'll take the discussion offline. Um, but I did, I did want to uh, thank you for mentioning this efficient water use. This is a huge area. We tend to uh, think that we can just uh, augment water supply endlessly. And that's no longer the case in, in India, in most parts of India. The Northeast is actually, is actually an exception to that general rule. But the efficient water use is extremely important, and this is an area that we, we, we do give a lot of attention uh, to at the World Bank. So we can discuss later. Thank you. Yes, uh, definitely that's the problem. Like uh, when the ministry wanted to introduce new trades. So now they have come up with the idea of mapping, skill mapping. That means what kind of trades they need to introduce in a particular ITI. So ITI Guwahati may have different requirements. ITI Imphal may have different requirements. ITI Arunachal, the one you're talking about, may have different requirements. So for that, we really need to focus on the skill mapping of a particular region when we introduce a new program or a new trade. Thank you. Uh, I'm Durga from Sikkim. So my question is to Dr. Otojit. Uh, because the government of India is spending a lot of money for skill development. And if you see in the Northeast also, I mean, in each and every state now, they have come up with a department, okay, skill department and the entrepreneurship. Um, the government is, you know, through different training and capacity building program, they are giving the training to many of the people, okay. But many of them, after completing the training, they do not want to take, you know, the, say for example, you mentioned about the carpentry, you know, masonry. So there's a huge, I mean, demand for them. But the government is also trying to give the, you know, training to them so that, you know, they have a, you know, I mean, a supply of, you know, demand, I mean, supply of labor in the state. But there's a no, I mean, the taker, I mean, okay. Even after completing the training also, they do not want to work as a carpentry or masonry. 
So what is your suggestion, you know, to, is there is a need for, you know, a kind of different type of counseling to the people who are living in the Northeast state, you know, because I can give my example of my own state, but I don't have any other idea about the other states. So that is number one. Number two is regarding, you mentioned about the youth aspiration and the tourism. So at one point of time, because I'm from Gantok, so at one point of time, I mean, the people, local people, local youth, they are very much interested to run, you know, the travel agent, you know. But after the IT revolution, you know, the people, those who are visiting, you know, Gantok, Namchi or any place in Sikkim, they uh, start booking, you know, their hotel, car, everything from, say, for example, Silguri, Calcutta or Delhi. So how to, you know, on the one hand, yesterday we discussed that, okay, we are deprived of, you know, connectivity, we don't have, you know, the high speed internet, all these things. But on the other hand, because of this IT also, the people, the local people in the state, they are facing the problem. So how to, you know, address these issues? Okay, sir, uh, very shortly, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I would be very brief. Uh, the first thing that uh, you have mentioned about the uh, the problems that you have when students pass out from the training is but they are not ready to begin to work. So the problem in the Northeast is that we have a serious problem of attitude problem. Like we basically lack this dignity of labor. Like we always want to, okay, hire someone or we do not really want to engage. But definitely the trend is changing now. Like if you talk about Infal, you know, we could see a lot many youngsters coming out in the road as a coolie, like doing all those like sugar cane, like no uh, thing. Uh, vendors and all tea vendors so we could see a lot many changes taking place but the problem is that we seriously have that kind of an attitude problem so we really need to think uh, about changing that attitude we need to need to have a counseling right of the youth okay about dignity of labor and all instead of remaining unemployed why not we take up those particular like the employment op uh, uh, opportunities that we have within the region within the state or within the district and secondly the point that you pointed about this the use of digital technology in booking and all. so definitely it has pros and cons but we have to take that particular revolution or development in a positive way how can we engage ourselves it's not that even if there are technological revolution also all right so everything also tries so there is always a mechanism when you talk about this digital uh, thing internet e-commerce so we thought that everything will be but you need people to deliver those items when we book some uh, articles or items from uh, from the website or not but we need people to deliver those goods so we really have to think in that particular way also thank you thank you uh, there, is, uh, uh, there will be no answer, just your observation, and with that, there will be closure. All right. Uh, actually, my question was for Ms. Haller, but uh, since there, we have run out of time, um, I'd just like to say I'm an urban planner by profession and a water champion uh, by fashion. In terms of um, water management, you say this region has a surplus of water, but it, it's actually, it hides the deficiency during those scarce months when urban areas like Guwahati, people rely on tankers to supply them water. So I, I, my question was, even though you may not be able to answer it, for an organization like World Bank, how can, it, um, how can their interventions trickle down to the ground level to pick up realities like this? Uh, be, uh, being an urban planner and, and an architect, I know that the people are getting disconnected from the water that surrounds them. 24-7 uh, water supply is going to even uh, make the situation worse because it makes them feel that water just comes out of the tap and they don't need to be responsible for it. So uh, that was a question maybe. Uh, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll request Ms. Hala to give, give an answer offline. And now I think we come to the close of this session. And if Mr. Mano Majumdar permits us, we leave the stage. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I know we are running out of time, so I've got just one pleasant duty to propose a hearty vote of thanks for the chair and all the panelists. Thank you very much. You've done a remarkable job. Let's put our hands together in appreciation to the chair and panel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. As the dignitaries, as the speakers, they withdraw. There is no break. I would request all the delegates to kindly remain seated. There is no break, I repeat. Kindly give us two minutes to make the changeover, and we will go into the valedictory session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
Sí, hola, sí. Sí, hola. Hola, sí. Sí, hola. Sí, hola. Please, I will ask you and request you to kindly be seated, settle down, so that we can begin the proceedings. Uh, thank you very much, and once again, I will request you to please put your mobile phone on silent mode. Thank you. Thank you so much. As you know, this is the last concluding session, valedictory session. We are... Um, we are really fortunate to have a number of eminent speakers with us. First, I would like to invite uh, Professor Bhupen Sharma, the director, this Amiyo Kumar Das Institute of Social Change and Development, to kindly come on the dais. Thank you, Bhupen. We also have with us Sri Deepak Kumar Barthakur, Vice Chairman, State Innovation and Transformation IO, Government of Assam with us. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Thank you very much. We have with us Mr. P.R. Jaishankar. He's the Chief General Manager from Indian Infrastructure Finance Company Limited. Thanks for joining us today, sir. And, of course, uh, Dr. Sachin Chaturvedi, the DG of RIS. So, before we begin the proceedings, I'd like to ask and uh, request Nidja to... Good afternoon. Uh, we'll start the valedictory session by felicitation ceremony. Uh, may I request my colleague, Manab Majumda, to please felicitate uh, Professor Bupen Sarma. request manager just step down a little and facilitate Mr. Deepak Kumar Bhattakar, please. <clears throat> my 
request manap to please uh, felicitate shripya jay shankar and last but not the least our co organizer mr sachin chaturvedi <laughs> thank you very much we start the session now so without further ado what we do we'll turn it over to session chairperson dr bupen sharma you can take it forward respected dignitaries on the dais and respected delegates and my friends it's my really proud privilege uh, to be here with you on this afternoon and uh, when i was actually requested at first to chair a validity session my instant reaction was that probably i'm a too small person for such a big event but nevertheless uh, i am grateful to rias and the minister of finance for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to be with you this afternoon and i don't want to take time because i am also very very eager to listen to the speakers of this well declared session thank you very much okay uh that was very uh, short and sweet session chair person so uh, now i would like to request uh professor sachin chaturvedi dg ris to share with us the salient takeaways from the consultation deliberations over last one and a half days thanks manav uh honorable chairperson of the session professor bupen sharma director uh, omio kumar das institute of uh, social change and uh, and development uh, mr jay shankar chief general manager of uh, indian infrastructure finance company limited and uh, 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 professor deepak kumar uh, uh, barthakur the vice chairperson state innovation and transformation ayog government of assam who is going to give the validity address today yesterday and today we had intense discussions in terms of how we go forward when we talk about physical and social infrastructure for regional development and huge uh, set of issues have come up uh, all across uh, the spectrum of uh, economic development social infrastructure and of course issues related to their uh, interlinkages the role of international agencies the role of state governments and of course the national government they have come up 12 major recommendations uh, that we could uh, uh, figure out from this and i'm thankful to my team at ris uh, led by dr dash and uh, and mr nayar to put this together uh, the recommendations i would not get into full details we are going to share to each one of you who have registered with us uh, on on email so i would be very brief in terms of calling out as uh, yesterday in the inaugural professor uh, amitab kundu had mentioned the whole objective of this series when and this is the uh, uh, sixth event uh, in the series that uh, ris department of economic affairs fiki cias so chairman exim bank have partnered all across the country and our objective was to uh, get states to come up with proposals that can be financed to bridge the infrastructure deficit Uh, the ministry of uh, finance department of economic affairs had this idea that at least we should go to 2.5 billion dollars this year to raise from uh, aiib for uh, infrastructure deficit that we see so the 12 recommendations that have come up some of them probably may help us uh, in terms of drawing out proposals that can be financed and 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 what we heard in the previous session uh, from railways from on waterways i think is an impressive account of how we are going to move forward the first uh, point is in terms of uh, low integration due to landlocked region so in the keynote address yesterday in the inaugural and later on it came out that historically 
uh, the, the Northeast was very well connected and after uh, partition the, the landlocked nature of Northeast emerged which has adversely affected the prospects for uh, economic growth. Uh, the recent efforts in terms of HERA, the highway, inland waterways, railways and airways uh, is going to pave way for uh, uh, major achievements. Assam's uh, emphasis on Agenda 2030 is a point that is uh, in context for for rest of the northeastern uh, states. There are several sectors identified: uh, uh, education, health, skill development, and of course uh, uh, sectors that are economically important in terms of horticulture, tourism, food processing, bamboo, and made in northeast as as some of the solutions. The effort is also in terms of uh, restoring and reviving maximum routes, including air strips for better connectivity. We already heard waterways uh, a while ago. Uh, excellent presentation uh, by Mr. Yadav on railways. Uh, it, it brought out how conversion of uh, uh, medium gauge to broad gauge in, in northeastern uh, states and connecting all the key capitals as, as, as a priority and trying to internationalize the, the linkage. Uh, the third major recommendation was in terms of uh, waterways and, and, and water itself which has emerged as a key strength for northeastern states. Out of 111 waterways, uh, almost 20 are in northeastern states, and out of those 20, 15 are in Assam. So how we are going to leverage that strength is, is extremely important. Waterways would be significantly lowering uh, the, the transportation cost and promote trade. Dredging and maintenance of dredging is required to develop the waterways. Moreover, inland waterways are to be developed. World Bank is, is helping, and the presentation from World Bank emphasized on three I's, so bringing in institutions, information, and infrastructure. And the fourth recommendation that we have is on uh, improving economic corridors. How we connect uh, with economic corridors in terms of identifying priority areas and trying to see uh, how different cities and urban centers are connected with less developed areas. The emphasis should be in terms of developing uh, growth poles that can attract investment and, and be a magnet for economic growth. Most efficient way of strengthening physical connectivity as well as creating multiplier effects across different sectors of economy. The sixth recommendation is in terms of digital technology and future of connectivity. Digital connectivity is the biggest challenge of the northeastern region because of the mountain terrain. Hence, special attention needs to be paid uh, for extending digital connectivity across the region, especially digital solutions to remote areas. Uh, next is uh, addressing infrastructure deficit as per local demand and needs. And this was emphasized yesterday. It also came up this morning. We need to assess local demand for infrastructure building. Merely for the sake of it, we should not be going on uh, with infrastructure projects because there is local resource uh, uh, constraint, but more of that uh, uh, impact on local population. Apparently, supply-driven approach to infrastructure development has overlooked the local development aspirations. Uh, besides mega infrastructure projects, micro interventions like storage facilities could help optimize the utilization of local resources for promoting entrepreneurship and job creation. In this regard, the important point is to have bottoms-up approach rather than top-down approach for developing the required infrastructure. Maximum value addition at the doorstep is required. For example, single crop agriculture in lower Assam restricts the choice of reaping the benefits of regional value chains. Next is encouraging grassroots R&D. Both the civil society intervention in the previous session and also the intervention that was there from the Vivigiri Institute emphasized in terms of exploring possibilities for grassroots uh, R&D facilities and how local engagement can be emphasized for skill upgradation. Strengthening region, regional value chain is our next point in which uh, local industries in northeastern region are losing their competitiveness due to global competition, poor infrastructure and unfavorable government rules and regulations. Proper pricing, efficient supply of raw material and product diversification can support uh, the local industries to catch up. Agri-based value chains probably would be the way forward. 
Next is focus on clean and green energy, which was emphasized yesterday at, at one full session. Uh, last but one is discrimination in, uh, in MDB funding of infrastructure projects. MDBs, the, uh, like World Bank, ADB, etc., fund projects in developed states like Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and so on, whereas the states like uh, Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim, uh, those need resources uh, for infrastructure development, continue to face the problem of low resource mobilization. There should be provisions for addressing the specific financing requirements of the aspirational areas so as to ensure balanced regional development in the northeastern region. And last is in terms of spatial think tank of uh, uh, NER. And, and as I mentioned, uh, the new institution that has come up as counterpart to NITI in Assam, uh, from where we have the Vice Chairman uh, Ashi Deepak Bhattakur here with us in terms of state uh, uh, innovation and transformation IOG of Government of Assam. Is, a, is an institutional innovation which brings forward uh, uh, the areas that, that my last recommendation connects to, spatial think tank for Northeastern region. The time has come that there should be a dedicated think tank for the Northeastern region at the central government level. The recent initiatives of NITI to establish a spatial forum for Northeastern region is a step in the right direction. However, I would like to add that RIS is also taking initiatives, and FICI is a great partner in terms of providing uh, the traction that is required with educational institutions and, of course, with the industry, to place a special institutional mechanism of the experts from the Northeastern region to articulate what uh, the Northeastern region needs for ensuring its holistic economic and social growth. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. That was an excellent uh, capture of all the salient points. And as you said, the more comprehensive report or the salient points of discussion would be emailed to all the participants. We have been discussing the infrastructure on last one and a half day but physical infrastructure or other infrastructure cannot move without finance, without funds. So given that, it's my pleasure to invite now Sri P.R. Jayashankar, Chief General Manager, Indian Infrastructure Finance Company Limited, to deliver his remarks. You have the floor, sir. At the outset, uh, let me express my thanks to RIS and all the organizers for having invited uh, me over here. It's, it's a great pri privilege to be with you. I, I was just going through the uh, 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 proceedings uh, yesterday and uh, today, and I should say it, it was really comprehensive covering right from infrastructure needs in aspirational areas to uh, industrial development, exports, value chain, networking, marketing. This is something which is very, very uh, crucial in this age of infrastructure development. And of course, the inclusive growth, uh, using infrastructure for inclusive growth. That's this this has really uh, you know uh, excited me uh, and uh, i should say uh, iifcl as some of you may know and most of you may not i do not know if uh, it's so popular here we are a development finance institution i i am uh, confidently making this statement that we are a development finance institution because infrastructure development and infrastructure sector needs development and we are here to finance uh, that. Because uh, as uh, Secretary Sharma was just mentioning in the last session, uh, DFIs, uh, the IDBIs and IICICIs and uh, 
the IFCIs, they went on to become uh, banks and uh, they lost out on what exactly, you know, development finance needs uh, uh, actually are. Uh, that is because we have actually adopted a very, uh, very, very uh, one-sided approach of following certain guidelines and norms which define development finance institution, uh, regulatory norms. But actually, uh, development finance goes beyond that and, uh, you know, uh, uh, going beyond the SLR bonds which were, you know, uh, the major source of finance for development finance institutions earlier, which gave them concessional finance, which in turn helped uh, them to finance uh, different sectors at very, very cheap costs. So those things, you know, after 1991, the reforms, they all vanished and they, they had no uh, money, they had had no source of funds and they had to fend for themselves and the universal banking concept came and then they uh, reformed themselves, restructured themselves. IFCI continued but IFCI had all the other problems. Uh, looking at it from a different point of view, today, today we are in a new age we have issues before us and infrastructure as such has backward and forward linkages. We were very happy to grow at a very, very uh, medium uh, uh, or maybe lower uh, ranges of uh, growth rates earlier because the government was funding infrastructure completely uh, before uh, in the 90s, I should say. In the 2000, 2005, we had, you know, we had the uh, uh, urge to grow faster. We had the necessary models. We, we brought in the necessary models to finance such faster growths. And the major model to finance that was a public-private partnership model where part of funding comes from the government and a part of funding comes from the private sector. The approach itself was the public-private partnership approach. And uh, the, special, the special abilities of the government and the special abilities of the private sector were to actually merge and converge and uh, lead to better development. We have seen, uh, uh, this, is, this has been a, uh, quite a journey for us. In the process, today, we have completed over 9,000 infrastructure projects in the country. We have, of this 9,000, more than 1,500 public-private partnerships in India, making India the world's biggest PPP market. We have had issues in PPPs. So there has been a very, very uh, mixed, a very, very uh, exciting journey full of learnings, full of lessons. But at the same time, we have still not lost uh, sight of the goals. That's, that's very important because Today, production function also includes infrastructure. Unlike the earlier one, which only talked about land, labor, and capital. That, that I, I have read it in the World Bank report. So we have, we have in infrastructure as an integrated, integrated function to enhance productivity. Productivity in land, in, in land, labor, and capital, and uh, through physical infrastructure like roads, power, energy, uh, airports, ports, inland waterways, and to develop skills, to develop the quality of manpower through social infrastructure, health, education, 
and so on and so forth. But you see, we have come uh, a long way. We have experiences before us. The kind of financial requirements that is being talked about today is mammoth. The government doesn't have that much of, uh, you know, uh, finance to, you know, uh, fund infrastructure on its own. That's very clear. At the same time, we have to grow fast. So fast-paced growth needs new age models. Banks today are not the instruments to finance infrastructure like they were doing. Because banks uh, in India, I think uh, last two days you might have uh, discussed this more. I don't want to talk more about it. Because banks are more... Uh, short-term finances and uh, they are more comfortable with a short-term uh, working capital industrial lending. That, that has, that's what they were meant to be and uh, probably going forward also they will have to you know, uh, rein in their efforts towards this uh, kind of uh, financial modeling. So who will do the balance financing? So new age financial instruments have been ushered in, the IDFs, the infrastructure development funds, the REITs, REITs have not yet succeeded in India. The INWITs, the masala bonds, and so on. But then they all constitute not more than 2-3% of the total requirement, which goes to more than $1.5 trillion today in the next four years. Imagine uh, last 10 years, up to 2017, we spent only about $800 million in infrastructure development. And in the next four years, would require 1.5 trillion. Uh, that's a very, very modest estimate. So, for having, uh, for meeting such demands, we need big, large development institutions because number one, the project sizes have increased. The projects are no longer small. No longer uh, in 2000 and 2005, we could. Uh, we, uh, the, a 500 crore project used to be regarded as a very large project, but today we have uh, metros which uh, comprise 20,000 crores at project cost. We have the biggest, uh, we have the largest projects in India, the uh, largest infrastructure projects in India, the dedicated freight corridors. We have multiple power plants. We are having bullet trains, we have high-speed rail, we, now we are looking at hyperloops. We have uh, the complexities, the technologies, all have changed, all have only made the costs go up, and uh, the challenges are much more. So in such an era, we have to look at development finance as an instrument which will be able to overcome the overarching financial architecture of the yesteryears. The financial architecture which the traditional banks had for financing infrastructure will no longer be applicable and we need a completely new architecture. The architecture will be led by a secondary market which IIFCL as an uh, innovative lender is, we are trying to do our bit for putting in place a secondary market mechanism. Uh, the corporate bonds would become the mainstay instruments in future. Probably the, the financing of infrastructure could be the first, the green fields could be taken over by the bank for three, four years in the beginning, followed by the corporate bond market which will replace the lenders after five, five years, four, five years. So that is the kind of architecture which is actually emerging. And the bonds will be the mainstay financers for banks as well. So who is going to do that financial intermediation? That is the question and that is where the development finance institutions have their relevance. And that's where IIFCL is trying to put its bit for developing a secondary market intermediation architecture where we can purchase the loans of the banks and enable them to generate more loans and we purchase the loans with the banks with the funds which we generate from the secondary market through 
bonds and through other instruments uh, which are subscribed to by different investors like pension funds, like insurance funds, mutual funds and all other entities which have an appetite for long term sources. So that will be the main stake for tomorrow and uh, we hope that uh, the kind of uh, issues that we are having today, be it the structural issues, the structural issues being the ones like clearances, the land acquisitions and so on and so forth, the contractual issues like renegotiations, uh, restructuring of uh, uh, concessioning agreements, instituting more concession agreements in different sectors, then uh, legal issues and uh, statutory issues, having a mechanism for, having a statutory mechanism for PPP framework itself in our country. So th these kind of issues are being uh, taken up and we are actually handling them in different stages and we hope that uh, at this stage I can say that uh, these are all in motion and we hope that the kind of architecture that is required, a secondary market architecture, uh, that would be in place uh, shortly uh, uh, with IIFCL being a central institution for uh, uh, infrastructure development. Besides this, I would say uh, there are the other demand side issues which need uh, uh, change in models, in modeling, particularly for social infrastructure and for uh, rural infrastructure, like health, education, and so on and so forth. We, our infrastructure development today has, you know, hinged on non-recourse lending. That will not work for social infrastructure. So we need to actually change that. And there is where we have, again, this development finance institution playing the fulcrum for leveraging the resources of the government. Maybe a government will not be able to uh, support such infrastructure on, uh, uh, on a single budget alone. Maybe the development finance institution has to play a role to leverage that single budget into 10 budgets and use that government uh, funds as repayments over that 10 years. So those kind of models also have to evolve for social infrastructure and uh, educational infrastructure because non-recourse lending will not. Such uh, ideas are already uh, being discussed. I'm sure uh, you have enjoyed this two days and uh, Gauhati is a very, uh, very, very significant uh, uh, location for this conference, I must say, because I'm, I must say this is the big, perhaps the beginning of the golden age for infrastructure development in the northeast because from look east we are now acting east and a uh, number of things are expected here and uh, with this uh, I thank you all once again and uh, good afternoon. Have a, a nice meeting. Thank you Mr. Jayashankar for articulating the need and role of development uh, financial institutions. Thank you for that. May I now invite Sri Deepak Kumar Barthakur. He is the Vice Chairman of State Innovation and Transformation Ayog, Government of Assam, to please deliver the valedictory address. So my colleagues. <laughs>
Namaskar. I, because of my little bit uh, handicap in my leg, because of accident, I had to sit down and address the August gathering here. Please excuse me for my inconvenience. Thank you. Before starting my lecture, I want to tell you uh, a short, share a short inf in information. In our state, Assam, the interface of uh, is the interface of uh, DDIO. You know, uh, we call it CITA, S-I-T-A, State Innovation and Transformation IO. That is a small piece of information I want to share with you. So. At the outset, I would like to thank the Ministry of Finance, Government of India, Rees and Fiki for this in invitation to speak at the valedictory session of this today's seminar. As I understand, the Gohati session is a part of the eight thematic lead uh, up events of the uh, uh, annual general meeting of the Asian Infrastructure Bank. It is indeed that Assam is playing host for the session on physical and social infrastructure for regional development in the, in the backdrop of the Act East policy and the announced tag time of Assam Expressway to Asian countries. On part of the advantage, as part of advantage, Assam Investment Summit. However, as we all know, development has many facets. It cannot be capsuled in to X crore of industrial investment or Y GDP growth. Exclusive growth and development, there are, no one is marginalized. And everyone enjoys at least a minimum living standard, mental and physical, if not optimum standard as the, uh, as the rest of the country or a state's a, a declared objective of development should encompass. We in India, with the current access on sustainable development goals as part of our annual budget and policy exercise, we underline the commitment. Government across the world have historically said stress as physical infrastructure as the engine of growth and development, transportation, communication, sewerage, water and electric system are all examples of physical in infrastructure. In fact, this is, the, this is true for a business also, brick, uh, bricks and mortar. And the tangible feature of the business is that as invest in a simplistic statement of fact which is widely recognized is that the availability of basic infrastructure facilities and services flowing from these are, uh, these are vital for economic development of the country. If well developed, they stimulate economic development and it and, and if inadequate, they prove to be hindrances in the growth process. Adequate availability of power supply would accelerate the pace of the of production activity. Adequate means of transport and communication would facilitate, facilitate market reach. Digital connectivity in today's world is probably another essential pillar of economic infrastructure as to on and so forth. 
but as they move up, development figure, as the, the development ladder, countries in the last century especially have realized that the sustainable growth and development, the creation of social infrastructure is as important. These are the hard and soft infrastructure like healthcare, education, social care, arts, culture, emergency services, they are the nuts and bolts of the bolts that keep the engine of development on the right track. Social infrastructure does focuses on human resource development. Lim implying the development of the, uh, of the skill, uh, skilled personnel as well as healthy and efficient human beings, including the institutional infrastructure to support these. On comparing the level of economic development of India's vis-a-vis -vis development, development economies, the important parameter of comparison remains the level of infrastructure status. A UK study supported the British Medical Journal targets that the, every one pound of invested in the community network and services, 10 pounds were moved in cost and poor, poor, or poor health, reduced crime, and better employment opportunities, among, the, among other things. Accordingly, physical and social infrastructure are complementary to each other. One and it reinforces the another impact of the other. Universal access to education, health, and safe drinking water is a must for any society to progress. But even after decade of government intervention in form of development planning, India has still gaps not only in the physical infrastructure but also Worry, worrying in creating adequate, inadequate, and social infrastructure. Despite various development plans, lack of or inadequate basic infrastructure, both social and physical, continues to remain a major constraint to progress in many parts of our country. Let me take the example of health. 70 years after independence, we still have in unacceptable rates of key health indicators of morbidity and mortality. About 75% of health infrastructure is concentrated in the urban areas, where just 27% of the population moves, indicating serious problem of regional disparities. Distribution of health infrastructure, public sector investment in healthcare accounts for less than 1.5% of the GDP in India. Among the lowest globality, globally, the government, however, seeks to increase the expenditure, expenditure of 2.5% of GDP by 2025. Of late, innovation and social infrastructure is seeing a positive trend in India, but uh, we still have much to go. The direct relationship between sustainable growth and development with physic, both physical and social infrastructure as well documented, thus we in the government must expedite the development and growth of infrastructural facilities to augment the pace of the economic development of our country. It can be said that developed infrastructure essential for every nation and governments must strive towards infrastructure development in a sustained manner to achieve higher socioeconomic development goals. How, now, I would like to focus a little on this region, Assam and Northeast. Despite its strategic location, bountiful natural resources, Of 
more edu educated a young population. This region has not seen such sustainable development of economic growth. The Northeast states exhibit some interesting paradoxes. Despite high literary rates, as in many areas, very health, key health indicators show poor performance. The development push and pull has thrown challenges on how to protect our forest cover environment, our rich sociocultural ways of life. For decades, poor physical infrastructure have acted as roadblock hindering the socioeconomic development of this region. And to me, increasing the in sense of alienation that has led to other social issues. Almost each of our states have entered into, an, into this vicious cycle of, of low development of infrastructure, low economic growth and prosperity, leading to social tensions, in many cases, adoption of violent extremism by a considerable sec section of the society across this region. Just on terms of economies, no doubt we have a lot of catching up to do if we are to, if, if we are to be a, in the focal point of engagement for act first or to, full, to fulfill our standard of aspiration of being the manifest of Astalaxmi, the donor ministry and the NEC has, have been acting as the social agencies to deal with, the, with matters related to the socioeconomic development of this region. NEC recognized five basic deficits in its NER, NER 2020 document. Basic needs, deficit, infrastructure deficit, resource deficit, deficit of understanding of with the rest of the country and the governance deficit. Recently, the focus has been developing physical infrastructure, be it air connectivity, rail links, or 10,500 kilometers of roads. An express highway project being the Brahmaputra River uh, has been announced. Increasingly, education and healthcare span the society, social security schemes have been developed. However, to ensure the inclusive development, we need to focus on multi-dimensional aspects, even more so in this region. A, availability of physical infrastructure in transport, communication, and power. B, industrial growth and agricultural economy performance. C, social and institutional infrastructure related to health, education, social security, and physical security. D, finance. We do not have a good credit deposit ratio or accessibility to financial institutions and credit in this region as yet. Cost of supply chain is high, high reading to low financial availability of the projects. E, human development, employ, employability, and services. India can only develop sustainability and avoid the poverty and older uh, under, under development cycle if we continue to grow and better our economic growth. Trajectory. And we in the Northeast cannot be mere onlookers in this story anymore. The way our region grows will impact a large part of that growth rate, especially the other regions in, uh, in Plato. My Department of State Innovation and Transformation Ayog, since coming into existence in later half of 2016, have been attempting to define a development story of, for Assam that looks at both physical and social infrastructure. 
Recently, we have concluded the conclave on tea industry, which brought uh, together a, a holistic agenda of discussion and, and ideas from productivity and quality management issues, supply chain, marketing, labor welfare to tea tourism as an economic activity. However, I am very much conscious that our efforts are just the beginning and we need much more aggressive and strategic way forward. I therefore look forward to the outcome of these last two days. And I call upon all of you to come forward and join us with your ideas, suggestions, and concepts in where we can make holistic development a reality in this region and establish sustainable economic and social infrastructure rules. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, statement and of significance. We really appreciate uh, your kind efforts and we have enjoyed your address. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request a session chair, Professor Bhupen Sharma, to make his remarks. I know he has been very patient. He didn't really speak in the beginning, but we'd certainly love to hear from you. Thank you, Manab. Uh, respected Professor Chaturvedi, Sri Jay Shankar, and Sri Bhattaku, and my old friend Manab. I don't want to stand here for long between you and the lunch, definitely. I'll be very precise. Uh, from the very brief presentation made by Professor Chaturvedi, I could make out what happened in this hall since yesterday morning. And uh, what I could uh, you know, develop my idea that many vital issues were discussed and I'm sure this region probably can, I mean, it has been comprehended what kind of a developmentalist model, what kind of, you know, what should constitute the agenda for development of the region as a whole. But when I think of development of the Northeast region, uh, immediately it reminds me of Verwin Alvin, Verrier Alvin, his philosophy for NEFA, what he developed in 1950s. And from 1950s to 2018, now till now, this region over the last more than six decades have experienced a series of developmental interventions. But the net result of this series of interventions and experiments on the region are far beyond satisfactory. Therefore, we have several problems still we have been confronting with the question of insurgency and many other questions. When we are talking about mainly social infrastructure, physical infrastructure is something which can be, you know, well planned. It's just sort of a kind of technocratic exercise, I would say. But when we are talking about social infrastructure, probably we cannot miss out one very, very important point. The social institutions of these regions, which are very, very unique in nature. Most of the state, Assam is not definitely a typical representation of the Northeast as a whole. Assam, again, is an exception. If you compare Assam with the rest of the Northeastern states, the social institutions that I'd like to point out are still heavily influenced by the subsistence agrarian economy of the region, which is still marked by, to a large extent, shifting cultivation and the associated social institutions, cultural institutions. So anyway, we're talking about any kind of developmentalism covering this region. Probably we cannot ignore it, we must not ignore 
the importance of such social institutions. One of the very recent examples I'd like to cite before you, probably we haven't forgotten, about four or five years back in Arunachal Pradesh, more than 100 MOEs were signed with different private companies to harness hydroelectricity, hydropower of the state. What happened to those MOAs? Why not? Most of the hydropower projects and besides for our natural products were technically feasible, without any doubt. But most of the projects are not feasible considering the social fabrics of the state. And I'm sure just a couple of days back, I came back from Itanagar, I, inter I mean, I interacted with a lot of you know, people there, what I could find that most of these projects are not going to see the day of the light, I mean, light of the day. It's simply not possible. Therefore, when we are talking about development interventions for the Northeast, probably we need to take into account many other factors which are generally ignored, which are generally not focused on by the policy, you know, planners and people like us. I'm just pointing out only one aspect of this, and there are many such. When you are talking about infrastructure development, you go to Nagaland, what are the biggest hurdles you will face? It is the society and its relation with land, which is in a unique case, like our natural produce, where land is not a property of the state. And if you think of Land Acquisition Act 2013, definitely you will have a series of other challenges to confront with when you are going to the hills of the region. Therefore, I mean, I'm, I, mean I, do, I, I want to be very, very brief, very, very precise. My only request is that whenever we are thinking of any sort of developmentalism, so far as the Northeast is concerned, probably we should pay adequate attention to the social institutions which are still, to a large extent, governed by the subsistence economy and the other vital questions. With these few words, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, you have highlighted the need for correlating the development aspects with the social institutions, and that is certainly very well taken. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have to tolerate me for another couple of minutes. I have got a very pleasant duty. First, let's put our hands together in appreciation of the chair and the panelists and the valedictory <laughs> speaker. This is for this session, but I have got a uh, few, uh, kindly allow me 30 or 45 seconds more, uh, because as we come close to the conclusion of this very important, interesting, and exciting program, it's my pleasant duty to put on record a uh, vote of thanks on behalf of the co-organizers, both RIS and FIKI. And of course, our thanks are due first and foremost to the Ministry of Finance for kindly giving us this opportunity. We really, I'm sure, at such a degree, both RIS and FIKI, we have been enjoying doing this important piece of work. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers, experts, resource persons, many of whom I know have traveled a long distance. Thank you very much for your kind efforts. There were several senior level government officials, both from central and state governments, who have been gracious enough to be with us and they have shared their insights, their perspectives. We are most thankful to all the senior officials from the governments. As well as there are many experts, resource persons from development banks and other institutions. 
of course all the participants delegates we are most thankful to each one of you without your active participation this program would not have been as successful as it is i know again many of the participants have come from other parts of the country taken efforts thank you very much for your time and thanks for your uh, con active contribution from the institutions organizers from rias dr sachin chaturvedi and his very competent team of dr priyadarsh shidash uh, professor milind chakravarti mr arun nayar mr malhotra mr ali mr amit gupta thank you very much for all of you for, thank you very much to all of you for your hard work good work and of course from fiki uh, my own organization uh, bisujit and nirja and the team uh, for their all hard and sincere work without which it would not have been possible i would like to also thank friends from media and the staff of the hotel for their collaboration for the cooperation i hope i haven't missed out any one in case i'd missed out any institution and any individual my apologies in advance let's put our hands together in celebration of this so with that we have come to the conclusion of this significant program this program stands concluded